Well, I'm here today with Barney Nelson to visit about her wonderful book, Making Circles, the Memoir of a Cowboy Journalist. Thank you for, for giving this a go, Barney, and, and joining me to visit about your book. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just going to start by saying that uh, it's been a long time since I read a book that I was so excited about reading. I think I emailed you as I was sitting in the car dealership and I was, you know, reading the book and, and underlining passages. And I just, um, I'm in total awe about your ability to take me on a journey uh, into your past and and share these uh, very personal events, um, but I feel like I'm I'm right there with you. So uh, so great job at being such an incredible uh, wordsmith. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I I feel like a lot of people um, who write about the cowboy, you know, just come out for a few days and interview or something and. They don't really live that life. So I, my goal was to try to write about it from the outside. There's a lot of people that should be writing these books, but they don't want to write or don't know how to write or, or whatever. So until somebody else comes along, I guess I'm stuck with trying to at least say something. What do you think... Um... What do you think is so captivating about the cowboy life for people uh, who might never experience it, but, but, but want to learn more about it? I don't really know. Um, I've tried to figure that out for a long time, but somehow we've made that kind of poverty romantic, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> and um, I guess it's probably because people Everybody loves horses, I, I think, um, but very few people anymore have the opportunity to actually live with them and get to know them as friends and coworkers and all the ways that people who ride horses regularly get to know them. And so that fascination just never seems to go away. And tell me a little bit about the, um, what, what prompted you to collect uh, all of these writings in one place? Because I think some of them appeared in different places and, and what was the motivation for, for creating this book? Um, I think just because I'm getting old <laughs> and um, when you, you know, have lived a pretty long and interesting to me anyway, life, um, at the end of it, you think, okay, have I learned anything that's worth preserving or worth passing on? And so really I started it just to see what I had, you know, to see if there was anything there that might be worth saving. And then I got interested in it for the sake of my grandchildren, because they all know me as an old lady and they, they never knew me, you know, when I was young and crazy. And <laughs> So those two motivations, I guess, kind of um, meshed and, and the farther I got into it, the more fun I was having because it's like I got to live it all over again. And um, so whether anybody else ever reads it or not, it was worth it, I guess, to me just to write it. Does, does what you're writing about in this time period in this book, does it still exist or has it gone away? Um. A few months ago, I would say it, it, it hasn't changed at all. But since then, we've had a really serious drought here in West Texas. And um, the ranch that I lived on and wrote about a lot in the book, the 06, um, basically sold all their cattle off and let most of their employees go. And so, and that was not unusual I mean a lot of ranches here in that kind of shape and so I don't know if we'll ever get it back now because you know the the cattle that made it possible and the horses that made it possible and the people that made it possible had to find something else to do some other way to make a living and I I don't know 
country's still there and it's still i think the most logical economic way to make it work is still the way it was always done because this country doesn't lend itself very well to pickups and trailers or at least not if you know you want them to keep running <laughs> <laughs> the rocks and the rough country takes a toll on them pretty fast so it's really more logical to drive the horses around in a remuda and you know the old ways of working and then when you get there to have the cook be there with a meal for the cowboys because you can't go back to town it took you you know hours to get there so um so i think logically if we're gonna have still have ranching here it's almost gonna have to go back to some of that but but i don't know and that's another reason i'm glad i did it because i i think it was a wonderful life lots of hardships and lots of um sacrifices but i feel real lucky and, and most of the cowboys around here we've talked about it a lot here in the last few months um saying how lucky we feel that we were able to be alive during this during the time that we were and out there doing what we did what do you if that uh, if that way of life goes away what uh what is lost what 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 um what do we lose by losing that oh you ask tough questions um <laughs> i don't know um to me the cowboy or the reason i admire the cowboy and feel like you know if there's anything about that way of life that needs to be preserved and needs to be admired is the the way we feel towards um the craftsmanship of doing the doing a job well mm -hmm. um you know, nobody does it for the money and nobody does it for the fame <laughs> um you know it's always just because you love that life and you're willing to give up everything else you know from kids that sacrifice you know being able to hang out in town with their friends very often um there's just so many different kinds of sacrifices that people make to to live that life so i think we're losing that as a society that um people don't seem to have the same kind of pride in their work and in um in the skills that they it, it takes years and years and years to master and not mastering those skills for the sake of um showing off or for the sake of beating somebody i mean these are all things i've heard ray hunt say over and over it's just a competition within yourself you know that you want to get better you want to learn more and you want to be a better communicator with your horses and your cattle and with the country, the wildlife, the water systems, everything. And um, so you just keep, um, it's kind of like writing, I guess, you know, it's once it gets in your blood, you don't do it for the, or, or I don't do it for, it's a good thing, uh, sell it, you know, to be writing a bestseller. I do it because I think this story ought to be preserved. So that's in some library somewhere a hundred years from now, somebody might run across it and read it. Well, and I think, I mean, for, for me, for me reading it, um, there's so like the, the themes of, of, of like isolation and being separated, but then also like this intense camaraderie of people from all different backgrounds and all different, um, you know, education, race, religion. I, I'm thinking of the, I think as in the school chapter where you're talking about sitting around uh, in the rain, uh, waiting, waiting to go. And I mean, like we don't often encounter people in our lives from that much diversity. And then you're working together and you're, you're bound to, to, to work on this thing together. And, um, 
I don't know. I just, I found that passage. I was rereading this morning and I found that passage just, just really, really moving and inspiring to think about, you know, it's about, you know, becoming a better person to, to do, a, to do a good work. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know, um, if I'd even be comfortable saying it's about becoming a better person. I think it's just because, you know, we aren't saints <laughs> and there's a lot, <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of those cowboys that I talked about in that passage. Um, you know, they weren't saints. They all have faults. And, you know, so it's not that it makes you a, a better person. It's just that it makes you appreciate your uh, co-workers mm -hmm. because you have to trust them. And I think soldiers, you know, get into that same kind of camaraderie and maybe firefighters and people who work together in dangerous situations or in in um, hard physical situations tend to develop that kind of camaraderie. And I think we're all hungry for that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard to find it. And I don't think you're gonna find it with, you know, a desk job or, I mean, I've, I don't know because I have never worked in a fancy office, you know, with a bunch of cubby holes and all that kind of stuff. But it just doesn't seem like it, it would be as possible to develop that kind of respect for your fellow workers as you do when you're sharing the same meals, eating off the ground, drowning in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so I... Um, I guess because I'm a writer and then because I was a college professor uh, and taught literature. One thing that I just really believe in and hang my hat on is what we call un the ver universal qualities of humans. You okay. know, that if you deep enough, you get to this truth that seems to um, cross all religions and all economic situations and continents and languages and everything it's like working with a horse you know there's um in order to get along with a horse it doesn't matter what language you speak or what religion you are <laughs> you know you you kind of have to um learn how to relate to and understand that animal that can't even speak um and it's, I think, the same with people. So somewhere down inside of us is that universal connection. And if you get cold enough or hot enough or tired enough, I think you get there. I don't know. I'm kind of talking over my head here because you ask questions <laughs> that I don't have to answer for. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um... Okay, I'll try for an easier one. Let's see. So <laughs> tell me, um, and I know that you, you've you written about this in the articles in the magazine, but you, you talk about Ray Hunt in the book. Um, he's mentioned quite a bit uh, and how he shaped your writing uh, and your writing. Talk a little bit. I, I'm always uh, so interested in that sort of lightning bolt moment when people see what he was doing for the first time and, and there's and that recognition of it of its importance so could you talk a little bit about that experience for you um i think it connects to what i was just trying to say sort of um because i think whenever i was the first time i was standing there watching ray work with horses and listening to him i felt like he was talking to me at that universal level um, you know, that I, I totally got it, you know, and I, I totally agreed and I totally, um, realized that he, he wasn't just talking about horses, you know, he was talking about life in general 
and um, and it was just magical, you know, it was just, um, it was like the first time maybe somebody ever understands you, <laughs> you know, yeah. your, your crazy ideas or accepts you how you are, even with your faults and, you know, whatever problems that you have in your life. Because I felt like, um, and I and I think I saw a little bit of that, you know, that there were people there standing around that, those round pins back in those days, and probably still are today, that had been in prison, you know, that had been abused as kids. I mean, all kinds of backgrounds, but we all got it. And we all felt like Ray was talking right to us, and that he got us, no matter, you know, how many problems we had and that was so refreshing and that's got to be how the horses feel mm -hmm. you know that somebody finally is not just trying to manipulate them not just trying to force them to do this or that but finally somebody actually respects them understands them and is willing to be their friend and mm -hmm. by friend you know that brings on a whole different <laughs> level of understanding, I guess. Yes. Yeah. He, he offered that. And, you know, I've heard him and Tom both say that, that the horse, the horse offers you a friendship at some point and you offer him a, friendship at some point and so you you sort of try to do that with your fellow man um and I think when it turns into something that doesn't work at least for me and the experiences that I had it was whenever that your motivation was not for um uh, for um for the sake of just mutual respect and mutual um, working together for a mutual cause. It's whenever you did start to drift over into being manipulative or you did it for the sake of pride or you did it for, you know, all the other reasons that humans come up with for what we do. And um, it just kind of breaks that bond when you do that. Um, and it, horses seem to be more sensitive to that well I don't know if that's true because I think humans are very sensitive to that too and you know once you um, start trying to convince somebody to do something they don't want to do that's there's not a purpose for or other than just you know the human's entertainment or something um then I think you run into a little resistance. I'm not. It's sure. so it's so hard to talk about, right? Because it's a it's a yeah. fee, it's like this feeling I can feel it, and so then I mean, and that's why I just love your yeah. writing because you're able to articulate something that you know before I'm just like okay, I can feel I can feel it, and then you're putting the the words to it so beautifully. Well, I kind of feel like that's the importance of storytelling. And that's the reason that cowboys tend to tell a lot of stories is maybe you can't put it into words, but you can sometimes find a story that illustrates what you're trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> and so that little um, situation in the rain, you know, with all the different people to me illustrated something I couldn't quite put into words and and I thought, you know, I, I trusted the reader, I guess, to get it if I told that story and told it as honestly as I could. To, um, and I think that's why we need stories and why we need books and movies or yeah. songs or all the different ways we have telling stories. So 
um, so I have a journalism degree and you have the word journalist in your title. Um, and, and in some circles, it's a, it's a dirty word and it's a word that, you know, somebody might feel uncomfortable sharing so, or, or claiming. So tell, tell me, uh, tell me about your definition of what a journalist is. Ooh, um, <laughs> yeah, that was the, the other main reason I wanted to write the book is, um, I wanted to kind of try to explain what I think a journalist is. And it was another one of those words that's pretty hard to put into, into, you know, here's what it is with bullet points or something. So I, um, tried to tell stories about, you know, following that career around and trying to, to do what I could. And, um, and yeah, I, I have a lot of strong feelings about today's journalism because it seems like kids are being taught or students are being taught to dig for the dirt and that unless it's negative, it's not the truth. Well, that's a really bad way of looking at the world because you know if the only thing that's true about our world is that it's a bad place and full of bad people doing bad stuff then why would we want to even live here and that's not what i found when i was out you know beating the bushes digging up stories and and trying to be a reporter and give those stories to the to the world um one of the things that Ray used to say that hit home with me was nobody ever finds all the pieces to this broken mirror of whatever might be the truth or happiness or whatever we want to label that broken mirror with, but everybody can find a little piece of it. And so I, you know, would interview people that um, maybe weren't saints, like I said, in their personal lives had a lot of trouble um maybe did drugs maybe beat their wives maybe you know cheated on them or whatever but usually they had a little piece of that mirror <laughs> if yeah, you dug yeah. to find it and so to me it was that was what we needed journalists to find is those kind of things you know the answers not the i mean it's pretty easy to find problems where they're everywhere but find yeah. an answer that's hard and and it's not just um fluffy stuff you know like somebody giving a waitress a thousand dollar tip that's not really an answer yeah. <laughs> that's temporarily fixing a symptom you know but so that's what I did was search for answers and I I never found a big answer of any kind but I think I found a whole bunch of little ones. And so it was that little collection of, or that big collection of little bitty pieces that I tried to put into one book to kind of give people who might want to follow this occupation a better goal, or at least another way to look at what they're doing. Um, and to encourage them to look for the good stuff instead of the negative stuff because mm -hmm. that's just as much truth maybe more so you know because it can help with right the bad stuff yeah well and if we narrowed our if we narrowed our focus to to only learn from people who are perfect or from sources who are perfect it'd be a pretty pretty short list <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah that that would probably take us down to zero I don't think <laughs> yeah they, Tom Dorrance would claim to be perfect is there um is there a, a portion of the book that you'd like to to share with us today I love I love hearing authors uh read their own work and so if there's a piece you'd like to share with us that would be fantastic um I've never considered myself a good reader but I will try and I guess since we talked about it so much, maybe I should read that section on standing around in the rain. 
um, I divided the book up into chapters. And so um, this chapter I called School. And I started it with a quote from Admiral William McRaven about Navy SEALs because I feel like that's a lot of what cowboy school is all about is weeding out the people you can't depend on. <laughs> you know, so if they're, if they're, if they really want to do this and they really want to become part of a crew, then they need to be able to be counted on. And, and especially whenever, you know, the, the going gets tough. So, um, and then this is how I began that chapter. I remember standing around a campfire one rainy morning while the 06 cowboy crew was cussing and discussing education. I complained that my writing students didn't come to class, didn't do their homework and didn't listen. So one by one, the cowboys started telling stories about school. Most of them claimed they never went to class, never did their homework or listened to the teacher. I knew them. Some had more money than others, but they all had pretty good lives and it didn't seem related to how many years they spent in school. Some had quit college after the second day. Some lasted almost a year. Some seemed to have spent half their lives in college. Some were better hands. Some had happier marriages, maybe better kids, maybe better health. But again, it had nothing to do with school. If I remember correctly, two of us were doctors, one MD, one PhD. Several hadn't finished high school. One had a forestry degree. Two had law degrees. One was called a preacher and several eventually became one. Several had agriculture degrees, one a degree in dancing. Several were musicians or artists or owned their own businesses. Three of us spoke no English. At least three spoke no Spanish. And the one we all respected the most could neither read nor write nor speak correctly in any language. Two had ancestors on the Mayflower. Two had ancestors who met the boat. Three were illegal immigrants, one of those from Canada. Two homeschooled their children. One sent them to a private school. Several didn't believe in children. One had everything he owned in a war bag that was sitting out there in the rain. One of us was probably worth several million dollars. One, we all agreed, was worth absolutely nothing. Our religions ranged from fundamentalist Christian to atheist to Taoist, Mormon, ghost dancer, and luck. We were married, divorced, single, cohabiting, one night standing, and abstaining, either by choice or not. Three of us were alcoholic. Two went to meetings and one didn't. One smoked pot. We ranged in age from 70 to 10. Our politics from red or blue radical to who the hell cares. We were one Sioux, one Apache, one African-American, one Australian, four Hispanics, one British, Irish, German, Scottish, French, and God only knows what else. Four of us were female. We were almost all wearing hats or caps boots, spurs, and slickers in various stages of wear and tear and cleanliness. Hunkered down in our slicker collars with rain dripping off hat rims, the only points we all agreed on were that the rain was good and we didn't learn to do what we were doing in school. One who had made it to graduation told a story on himself about feeling very smart after he came home from college. Now that he was the manager, he was not going to do things the way grandpa did. One thing he had learned at school was to put bluestone in the water troughs to kill moss and keep the water clear and sparkling. At first, the horses refused to drink it, but when they finally did, that pretty water made all the horses sick. Everybody laughed. The rain had stopped. The boss threw the last of his coffee on the ground and his tin cup in the galvanized dishpan. We followed his lead. We all stepped down off our high horses and scattered to mount our real ones and get back to work. In spite of our differences, we depended on each other, even though no two people rode the same way or possessed the same skills. A good team is not a bunch of clones. No, we definitely did not learn to do what we were doing in school. I just love that. I, I feel like I'm, I'm sitting right there with you and I can see, see those folks hunkered down in the rain. <laughs> yeah. Um... When you work together, gathering cattle, it kind of evens out all the differences between you. And um, especially if you're horseback and because it's 
all depends on how well you can do the job. And you try to put people who need a little more help next to somebody that can furnish that help if it's needed. And so, um, I don't know, it just is a, a really good way to think about work. And I think anybody should think about their work that way, you know, and, and maybe if they knew more about, and maybe they do, I mean, I haven't lived in that world, so I don't know, I guess I'm stereotyping them, but if people who, you know, worked in cubby holes on computers all day, if they knew more about the people sitting next to them, they might feel the same way we did, you know, towards each other. A lot of those people are still my friends today. That's been a long, long time ago. Yeah, I imagine uh, friendships forged in that way. They, a lot of time can pass, and then you you get with that person again, and it's like no no time has passed. Right. Yeah. Well, are there um. I mean, I don't know what to say, except for that. I think everybody needs to read this book. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I, I, I uh, it's going to be one that's on my bedside table that I'm going to go back to again and again. Is there any question that I, that I didn't ask you that you wish I would have asked you about it? That's a good question. And that's one I always like to use at the end of it of an interview that I did. Um, and I don't know. I think you asked some really good ones and you put me on the spot, but it was fun to be put on the spot because trying to put some of that stuff into words is, is hard to do. And I struggled mightily writing this book, trying to put a lot of those kind of feelings into words. Usually I had to put them into stories and um, so, and I think everybody's got a story you know that there aren't more interesting people than others I mean you know because if you really sit down and talk to somebody seriously everybody's got a story and everybody's got a little piece little piece of that broken mirror that they can share if you dig deep enough and that's what's fun about journalism and well and I know it's hardly fair to to somebody who spent their life crafting and picking the exact right word and molding I mean the, the, a writer's life is is finding the exact right words and writing and rewriting and shaping and then to put you on the spot and and uh i i understand that that's a different kind of a a way of communicating for sure well it makes me think and that's another thing that's fun about writing is that i very seldom when i first sit down to write anything i write a weekly column for a local little small town newspaper here and whenever I first sit down every week to start writing that column, I have no idea, you know, what I'm going to say. Um, and sometimes I just start scribbling, you know, writing loops or something until my pen starts to take off. And then I follow where it leads. I used to tell my writing students that I, I would challenge them. I said, give me a subject that you think I can't possibly write about. And, they'd come up with silly stuff like you know a pencil or something and so I'd write about Thoreau and making pencils and <laughs> <laughs> get into all the things that pencils do and you know the purpose of an eraser and blah 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 and they would just be slapping their foreheads like oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> well that that makes me think um one thing I, that I'd be curious about is um like, were there parallels between the, the cowboy work and the teaching work? Oh, yes. I mean, um, I don't see how anybody could ever become a teacher that hadn't, you know, worked with a crew and 
tried to get a bunch of yearling cattle to go in the same direction after they'd been weaned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really very similar. And, and I think, um, you know, the, all the different horses I rode, I could see a lot of those traits in my students and some of the things that I had learned, you know, about what to do or what not to do um, really helped me in the classroom. I've said, you know, my whole life or my whole teaching life that if I was ever a good teacher, I really owe it to Ray Hunt and the Dorrance family um, for all the stuff that I I learned from them. And, and it, you know, goes on to everybody I ever interviewed and all the cowboys that I ever worked beside and my grandchildren and my daughter. I mean, everybody that I've come up against, you know, has helped me learn a little bit more about how to teach and how to be a teacher. I miss it. I miss the kids. I don't miss a lot of the meetings and the politics but I, <laughs> yeah yeah I'm just working with students yeah my mom my mom is a retired school teacher uh and she just recently went back to teaching just two hours a day working she's a reading specialist and and she's like it's the best because I just go and help with the kids and I don't have to go to meetings and and I get my teaching fix so <laughs> I I have that in my family <laughs> so I understand that a little bit um so you, you uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about the the things that you think that you you started by saying the things that you learned from Ray and 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 Tom helping you be a good teacher uh, along with all the other experiences? But could you elaborate a little bit more, maybe on what what qualities or what um, I mean? Because I I do think that. Uh, what are your thoughts there about what qualities make a good teacher? Um, I think one, one thing is what I learned the very first day of the very first Ray Hunt clinic I ever went to. I think the article that I wrote about him um, that you just reprinted not long ago, I think I ended it by saying something like, you know, no matter what else, everybody that had watched him handle horses that day and watched his horse handle, help him handle horses that day, would never call another horse stupid. And so I, I feel like that was kind of the key to being a good teacher is my job was not to rank them into, you know, smart, semi-smart, average, below average, and stupid, because they all had the same potential. My job was to figure out how to unlock that potential and how to help them get the desire to want to learn and keep that desire. And no matter, you know, because one of the things that I've I told my grandchildren that seemed to stick with them and that they've repeated back to me a few times is that once they get that spark or I don't know what to call it, but once they're convinced that they can learn this, that they can do this, that they can do whatever, you know, they can solve any problem that they run up against. It may take them their whole life to do it, but they can do it then it doesn't matter whether their teachers are good teachers or bad teachers because they can learn just as much from the bad teachers because they can watch and see what kind of results they're getting and see how the other kids react to them. And they'll know that that's not the way they want to do things in the future. So um, the power kind of gets... I don't know if power is the right word either, but the maybe responsibility gets moved around a little bit to where they, 
accept the responsibility for learning um, and want to do that, want to learn and, um, yeah. and look for teachers that they feel like they can learn from. Yeah. Um, but if they do happen to be with a teacher that they don't like or they don't get along with or they don't think is helping them learn, they can still learn from them because they have that little spark inside them that lets them accept that and accept the accept learning from that teacher, you know, that maybe they can even help that teacher get to be a better teacher. Yeah. And, and that was what I think horses maybe tried to do with people, you know, that they would try to help us get to be better as we were trying to help them get better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. As long as neither one of us decided the other one was stupid. We <laughs> <had> a prayer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, we could probably visit all day. And, but before I let you go, I have to, the one, uh, one other thing in the book, uh, well, one of the other things that I just totally related to was your story about uh, flying down to get the perfect shot of the horses on the rope <laughs> and, and, and having the film in the camera. I was like, oh my gosh, it's like my, I haven't done the exact same thing. Nobody's flown me anywhere, but I've definitely had moments like that where I'm like, I just missed, I missed it. And, uh, you know, nobody else might know that I missed it, but I know that I missed it. But um, I, I loved, I loved that story because I related to it. Yeah. And that's, um, that's what I always used to tell my students. I said, people are going to get more from and learn more from the stories of you messing up than when you brag about, you know, winning the best, winning the championship game or, or whatever, because that's just going to make them, you know, be jealous or resent you or think, nah, I could never do that or whatever. No, but if they can identify with you a little bit over mistakes that you've made, then there's a lot more to base a friendship on. And I think that's partly why the cowboys that I considered friends um, tended to tell stories on themselves where they made, made mistakes rather than where they succeeded. And uh, like Bob Blackwell and Wally Lyons. <laughs> <laughs> do you, um, do you want to talk at all about uh, projects that you're working on in the future or do you want to just leave? We can, we can visit again some other time about, um, I mean, as long as this wasn't too painful, we can um, <laughs> visit about other other projects or or um, I mean, it'd be fun to visit about the, the the articles. I mean, there's just so there's so much in your writing. Um, I'm just so thankful. I'm so thankful to have to have these articles to reprint in Eclectic Horseman because, I mean, it's so helpful to have that firsthand view of going all the way back to the beginning of, of these clinics. And I mean, I, I did, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I didn't get to feel those feelings or see those sites. And it's just, um, it, it's like, I'm, but it's, but because of your writing, I have a front row seat on the edge of the round pen and I can learn along with you. So I'm so appreciative of the work that you do. Thanks. Um, sure. I'll be glad to talk again or whatever I do have a couple of things that I'm working on that might be of interest to him so just let me know okay all right well if there's if you I think I think we're probably good and um hopefully that wasn't too awful and uh we'll uh <laughs> give, give it a try another time mm -hmm.